Welcome back. My final guest today on the show is a man who very sadly has had to call time on his riding career this week, having suffered a really nasty fall in the jumper's bumper at Lingfield about a, a year ago. But the world is his oyster, so knowledgeable is he about so many aspects of the game. And already the man who used him so extensively in his riding career is putting his talents to alternative uses. And he was a, a big part of the, the Seven Barrows team who will have been celebrating Shishkin's fantastic success yesterday. He's multiple Cheltenham Festival winning rider, Jerry McGrath. Uh, Jerry, thanks for coming back on the show. Uh, on what's been a, must have been a pretty difficult week for you, it's sort of... A, accepting and then B, telling everybody that, that, that the riding career was going to be no longer. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nick. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a kind of an emotional roller coaster of a week, really. Um, I suppose kind of a good six weeks before Christmas, I knew progress had stopped with the shoulder. Like the, the hip had actually healed relatively well. The shoulder just, I'd really hit a, a brick wall with the shoulder and the, the nerve damage that was there and stuff like that. And I actually, I'd stop riding out even at that stage because the shoulder was that sore and things like that. And so I, I thought in my own head I'd kind of come to terms with it a small bit. Uh, and I thought this week wouldn't be too hard, like mentally. But when, like it, it was, it came out Monday morning, Monday afternoon. And once the phone started ringing and people were calling, and it was all good wishes and all positive, but yeah, it hit me like a, like a big, big brick. Because you'd already made up your mind that you were going to retire. You had no no option but to, to stop riding in races. Yeah, like, you know, I'd, I'd speak and spoke with my surgeon and a few specialists and, you know, they, they weren't happy to clear me. They wouldn't have cleared me. Um, and like I said, it's one of, even if you had a miracle that you did get past the doctor somehow, they, they couldn't stand by and, um, you know, say what would happen when you took a fall. And like I said, in this industry, being a jockey, it was only a matter of time when that was going to happen. So, yeah, like I said, it was kind of, it was a tough decision, um, but I suppose the fact it's probably been forced on me has just made it a small bit easier, I think. But, yeah, there's, there's no point dwelling on it. We just have to move on. Okay, and how are you sort of feeling in yourself now, yeah, physically? Are you are you okay? Yeah, yeah, like, like I said, on a day-to-day basis, living a, what you what some people would call a normal life, I suppose, is fine. But uh, just on a horse and stuff like that, it, it was very sore. So hopefully at some stage, we might just get it um, to a level where I can ride out a bit and stuff like that, which which is obviously a, a big thing I want to want to bring forward um, with your guys riding work in seven barrows and also like with the bloodstock just sitting on horses, whether it be point pointers or flat horses and things like that. And in terms of your relationship with with Nicky Henderson, we heard from him extensively at the beginning of the program. How important has that been in sort of sustaining yourself uh, mentally, really? Yeah, I suppose it was tough. Um, I was very keen for Nicky and his wife Sophie to be the first people to hear the news of, my, like, of the decision. Uh, so I actually told them before Christmas because uh, I, I would have been devastated if they'd found out you know, uh, secondhand or anything like that. So I sat down and we had the conversation and obviously we were all kind of upset. And I, well, I was very upset. It was, you know, it was hard work telling your boss that you weren't be, going to be able to ride from again. And um, and the first thing he said is that you know we, we want you to stay a part of Seven Bowers, which is a big thing because it was a tough chat and just to have that you know someone had that bit of confidence in you to say that they weren't just kind of moving you on and saying thank you very much it was a tough tough conversation but you know there was plenty of positives to take from it uh, and I know whenever I whenever I speak to, to Sophie Henderson she's always been throughout your career you know, your biggest champion she's always saying you know make sure Jerry gets the credit he deserves as, as not only part of our team but a, a massively respected rider in that team yeah, exactly. So Sophie's brilliant. She's you know she's a good supporter of all of ours. She really pushes us and she looks after us when we were kind of uh, injured and things like that. You know she's always the first person to ring up and check that we're okay. She's yeah she's a brilliant person. How did yesterday feel? Yeah, I was lucky enough to be there, Nick. It was it was incredible. I suppose like at the moment I'm kind of adjusting to like I went there with my partner Charlotte like and I actually said to her, you're going to actually kind of have to teach me what to do at the races from a like um, <laughs> person going there you know just a general member of public to watch the racing because. Like in between races, usually you're in the weighing room, you're flying around the place, you're weighing in, you're weighing out. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was just totally out of my depth there. And, you know, I actually, believe it or not, it was the first time you actually walked around Ascot Racecourse and actually, you know, took in how good a race course is and the facilities there from the public point of view. Because, like I said, usually we get there, you go into the weighing room, you walk the track, you go back to the weighing room, you ride, you go home. You know, it's very kind of simplistic that way. So it was very different. But yeah, the atmosphere yesterday was just incredible. I did pick up on Lee's point earlier about, like, I'd imagine sometimes in the middle of winter, Ascot, you know, looks very empty, really. can look very empty. But yesterday, just the atmosphere, the buzz. You know, I was actually stood in the stand right, um, right beside the winning line. And the fact that Shishkin only hit the front, what, you know, 25, 30 yards before, it was just incredible. And the roar that just... 
you know, and, and it was interesting because when I stood there, there was as many people shouting for Nergamin as there was for Shishkin. It wasn't a very one-sided mm. affair, you know. It was just a brilliant day, I thought, you know. And, and we heard from Nico earlier on, and he was, he was very frank. He said, turning for home, I thought I was cooked. Those were his words. Yeah. And I always think he's quite a cool character, and if we think the horse is cooked, he's probably got matters under control. But he said, no, I thought I was done. Yeah. Did you think he was done? Yeah, I suppose I, I can see what he meant. What he meant, and like I think probably everyone agreed with him. But I suppose just at home when you see him, like his bits of work, he's not he's not a fast, flashy horse. He always does his best work at the end of a gallop. And like Nico knows the horse so well, he rides him in all his work at home. And um, but that was just he just had such a good prep and build up to the to the race yesterday. His schooling was brilliant on Thursday. His last bit of proper work last Saturday was incredible. And yeah, no, it was just brilliant at all. I mean, what would so what would a horse? like him do at seven barrows in say his final piece of work for a race like this how how far would he work over what would he work with how what would it what would it look like that last preparatory important piece of work yes yeah, so like we've been very lucky now for the last kind of month five weeks we've been been able to use the grass in seven barrows the, the famous you know farringdon road gallops and it's been brilliant um so he'd have done his last real proper bit on saturday last saturday a week ago he'd have had a breeze on tuesday just through the you know just to clear the clear the pipes and stuff like that but last Saturday would have been his last proper bit of work a bit of fast work and how far would you how would you work over on the Farringdon Road Gallop normally yeah he, he, pro- he probably went about 9-10 furlongs as, as far as that yeah 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 Go- well definitely good 9 furlongs for mm. sure and then like they gallop out over a furlong and a bit you know you just ease off but you don't you don't pull up straight away and then you, you're quickening up through the through the work yeah oh yeah they like said they, they like you said it's one of those even though it's you're, cl- you're climbing the whole way it, it is you know, you have to go a good gallop from the bottom to the top because you're on very good horses too. You're not on 9,500 rated horses, you know. that You're on those proper horses that need, need to go a good gallop from the bottom to the top. And I guess the skill of being a, a good trainer is knowing that you've got to have good enough riders to, to make sure they get these bits of work right because if you get it wrong, that's it. Your, your race can be, can be done. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm finding it very interesting at the moment because I, like I'm, at, I'm on the ground at the moment looking at these gallops and like I said, a bit like being at Ascot today, it's kind of like the first time I've done that as well. Usually you're on the back of the horses working beside Shishkin or, you know, in behind them or something like that. But yeah, I'm kind of looking at it from a different angle now. And yeah, it's fascinating. You know, you can, you know, you know what sort of lads are riding good bits of work and you know if lads are coming past you too quick on moderate horses or slower horses, they've gone too steady early. It's, it's fascinating, you know, it's a kind of a, it's a different dynamic for sure. And all this, which you clearly find very interesting, is this a precursor to one day taking out your own licence and training horses? Uh, I can safely say no. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, I'm not. No, training You never... strike me as a completely obvious candidate for it. No, training has never, never appealed to me whatsoever. Um, yeah, I suppose financially and stuff like that, it can be suicidal towards some people. But yeah, I just, I just don't... I, I don't see myself training in something that I, I've never really even contemplated too much. Is that because you wouldn't want to, to wear that much stress? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, and I suppose you know yourself. It's it's probably widely known that horses are probably the easiest part of the job. It's dealing with you know owners, trainers, or staff. Just you know, just that side as well. You know, training the actual horses in the morning is probably you know an easy part of it. Uh, but yeah, it's just whatever comes with it as well. It, it's it's hard work, and you know, it's something that uh, something that doesn't really uh, interest me too much. I know the bloodstock side of things floats your boat quite quite significantly, mm. and you've been kind of at that for a little while, haven't you? Yeah, the, I've just a massive passion for the bloodstock and just the, the sales side of things. And um, like I said, when I did get injured last last January, you know, the surgeons that, that did the operation stuff me, they were fairly, you know, they, they did say to me, there's a big chance you, you won't get back race riding. You know, the amount of metal work they put in and the screws and stuff like that. Um, and I suppose at the time I didn't want to believe them. I kind of said, yeah, yeah, whatever, that's fine. Yeah, thank you very much kind of thing. I was probably a bit blunt. But um, yeah, so with that and just in the back of my mind, small, but I suppose it, like, I'm going to be off for a good six, seven, eight months, I suppose. So I'm going to have to utilise and, you know, use my time wisely. And I suppose I just used it kind of towards building a few more contacts with the, in the bloodstock world and bought a few more horses for people and a few trainers. And, um, yeah, I suppose I was always kind of etching towards just in case I didn't get back, you know. Mm. And so that might beget a significant opportunity, you hope? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I said, I've built up a few clients now already and things have gone well. So I'm um, looking forward to the next chapter. Um yeah, onwards and upwards. Okay, good. Um, as far as this last year is concerned, I mean, it's, it's a long time to have that sort of hanging over you. Um, to what extent 
did that sort of affect you on a on a day to day basis? Did you find you could sort of function? Do you find your relationships could function okay, or was it sort of gnawing away at you? Um, I suppose after the initial kind of period, you know, like the first three or four months where I was like in a lot of pain, the whole like every day I was in a lot of pain. And like I, I was very thankful towards Oxy House um, and the IGF. They were incredible. Uh, they worked very hard on me just day in, day out. I was in there twice a day and things like that just to try and just I had to do the re- rehabilitation that the shoulder and the hip needed. But I suppose mentally it was tough, but I suppose it was always going to be a long road. I knew that it was never going to be a quick fix. Although I did think, apparently, when I was in the hospital and in Brighton after the operation, I was trying to get back in time for Cheltenham and the Aintree and things like that. And <laughs> probably at the time, it was probably a good thing because it kept the mind kind of focused. But I wasn't long realising that that wasn't going to happen, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose you have to have that goal, don't you? Yeah, I in think... In some respects. Yeah, I suppose as sports, sports people, we always kind of set goals and then you want to fulfil your targets and stuff like that. So I suppose it was something to look forward to, but yeah, that, that uh, bubble was burst fairly quickly. And can you reflect with pride on, on, on what you've achieved? Do you look at that body of work and think, it was worth it? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, Nick. You know, like, um, some, we had some brilliant, brilliant days. Um, I, like I said, I just love being around horses. And, you know, I kind of said to someone that in an interview, like, I lived my dream for 12 years and got paid to do it. And um, hopefully we can move on to the next dream now, you know. Um, what what was the what was the highest point for you? Do you think? Um, I suppose the Cheltenham winners have to be up there, but there was a few lovely entry winners as well. There, a horse called Thienval, who was a very kind of crucial horse in my career, because you know even if you're going through a bad spell, you could always looking for you always look forward to riding a few nice horses like Thienval, those high rated handicappers and stuff that will bring you to the Saturdays and you know the big festivals. Um, but yeah, all, all those all those winners, and then obviously just being just being involved in Seven Barrows back through the years we're talking about today, like when Long Run, you know, Bobsworth, Simon Siggs, Finnings Rainbow, the list is endless, and just being involved with those horses and all the people you meet, because you know, you know, in this industry, it's full of great characters and you know, great, good stories. And like I said, it's, it's been a pleasure to be involved with Seven Barrows for the last kind of twelve, well, eleven, twelve years. Who's the best horse you've seen at Seven Barrows? You never mentioned Sprinter Sacra in that list. Yeah, but I suppose Nico was always closely related with Sprinter Sacra, and at the time I was always riding Simon Sig. And it was only probably a few times, very, very rarely now, because it was a bit frightening. We worked the two of them together. Mm. When they worked together, it was, it was very special. Because they were, you know, a bit different to Shishkin. In their bits of work, like, they were, they were fast, very fast. And those two working together was probably the, would have been your highlight of, you know, seeing some of the real superstars. So you would always be on Simon Sig. Yeah, yeah, that's and Nico would, and this was before Nico was riding him in races, wasn't it? This yeah. was when Barry was riding Sprinter Sack. Well, yeah. both of them, yeah, yeah. And Barry obviously had the the privilege of just riding him every so often, and obviously on the track, and yeah. But Nico rode him every day at home. This is like this is you know seven eight years ago, um, when they were probably just kind of hurt or yeah, just kind of gone from their bumper to hurdle stages. You know, when they were really really on the upward curve. And who would who would come out on top of a gallop between those two? Did you ever beat Sprinter Sack or in a gallop on Simon Sig? To be fair, they, they always, and I'm not just kind of saying this now, they always would have been, there would have been nothing between them. And like, we've never. But he been, couldn't get you off the bridle? No, no. And you'd never have asked them to come off the bridle, but they didn't need to come off the bridle at the same time. You know, it was always, always very kind of uh, sensible work, but yeah, together they were, they were a bit special. That must have been exhilarating, just knowing that you were riding a horse of that talent. Yeah, exactly. It was just, just very unfortunate that he never got to fulfil it on the track. I know he won his grade ones, he won, he won at the Cheltenham Festival twice. Uh, but yeah, he probably there was more to come from. It was just very unfortunate that his uh, his career was cut short. Do you feel he would have been another one of those in that bracket? You know, we talked about the Sprinter Sacker Alti or Shishkin mm. legacy. You think he'd have been right in there? Yeah, definitely. He definitely had the ability. Um, he had a great mind as well. Once he the older he got, the better he got. You know, with his mind. But yeah, he was he was a very special horse, Nick. When I mean, I asked Nicky the question earlier on, but I, um, it's probably not something he particularly wanted to kind of consider at the moment, but. When I looked at that list of time form ratings and I saw Shishkin on yesterday's run was already a pound ahead of Altior's peak rating. Um, how do you look at that, having such an intimate knowledge of the two horses? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, really, isn't it? You know, it is. Um, like I said, there are two different. There, there are two different types of horses too. You know, Altior. He was all like, especially in his early days. He was just. He was always a very good workhorse. Always travelled very well. Whereas Shishkin's that just a bit more laid back. You know, he's. Um, 
he takes everything in his stride. But yeah, it's interesting that there's only a pound difference at the moment. I'm not going to start. I, I'm not going to start this routine of like encouraging everybody to step Shishkin up and trip because everyone wants to see this battle between him and Enegu Men carry on and on and on. But um, it's interesting that people used to encourage, try and encourage Nicky to run out or over a trip. And actually, listening to you and listening to Nico, clearly he was a very fast horse. He was quite yeah. flashy, fast horse. This horse, I mean, and David Minton was saying much the same to me earlier in the week. Shishkin, it's kind of like he's a um, he's really a sort of staying chaser, masquerading as a as a very good two miler. Yeah, for sure. I suppose he won his when he won his point to point two. I suppose you kind of bought him with the intention he was going to be two and a half miler, you know, and as, as, and even more so after a few bits of work and stuff like that. But like I said, he's doing what he's you know what he's doing best over two miles at the moment. I suppose you don't need to set him up and trip, but it's, it's probably an option that you could just you, you know you could view down the line for the time being I think everyone's um, I think the public wouldn't be very happy if we went two and a half at Shetland this year that's for sure anyway I think it's going to be a brilliant clash again over two miles So if, if bloodstock's going to be a significant part of your career is is, is trying to identify um, the next great horse something that really um, turns you on effectively Yeah and I, I suppose I've been very lucky like being associated with Seven Bars and riding all those nice horses on the track you, you get your eye and see what a nice horse is and you can very easily identify a not so nice horse, you know. So yeah, like I said, it's it's been a massive help, and hopefully it, it'll help going forward as well with my kind of future future targets. Um, well, Jerry, I, I wish you all the best with it, um, and uh, keeping my fingers firmly crossed. Uh, what have you got sort of planned in terms of where you're going to be on a race course over the next over the next few weeks? Did you find yesterday an okay experience? It wasn't too it wasn't too troubling for you. No, that, no. Like I said, I, I think every, it's going to be hard to live up to expectations now after yesterday because mm. to go racing kind of for the first time since retirement and to have a day like that you need and to just get, get a few buzz. Plumptons and Huntingtons <laughs> yeah exactly it's probably a good show probably Leicester on Tuesday might be the next show but yeah and like I said I'm, I'm looking forward to the future and uh, kind of in talks at the moment too with a, with a bloodstock company and uh, hopefully there'll be a few more developments with that this week oh, and obviously just keep my foot in the door with Seven Barrows as well that sounds fantastic uh, and you do you anticipate staying in in the UK, or would you go back to Ireland? Or um, staying staying in the UK, I have no plans of moving back to Ireland for the time being. Um, I enjoy living over here, and I suppose all my contacts I've worked here all my life, and all my contacts and friends I suppose over here for the for the time being anyway. And um, any plans to head to the Dublin Racing Festival? Um, not I'd at the moment. I recommend that. Not for, at the moment for a punter. Um, no, not at the moment. So we'll have to wait and see. Well, we will be there with uh, with bells on 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 Racing TV.